and welcome to Confronting Injustice. I am your host, Linda Solomon, joined by our co-host, James Watson, as we discuss the injustices of the criminal legal system. Our guest today is Robert Foxworth. Robert is a paralegal who specializes in juvenile cases um, and does a host of other things. And so it's a pleasure to have you here. And perhaps you can give us a little bit about who you are um, and how you became involved in this um, paralegal work. Uh, it started when, um, when they convicted me and put me in prison. And while I was there, you know, I realized, you know, I come from an inner city community. Your families really don't have that much money to pay for lawyers to represent you, to get you out, at least the good ones. You're always represented by a public defender and some of them really don't care. So my whole thing, when I got up Walpole where I was at, I said, the only way I'm gonna get home is if I learn this law and get myself home. The problem was the better you got in there, a paralegal and learning how to fight post-conviction cases, you win other cases I have, but I just couldn't win my own. So it gets to a point where you're just fighting and fighting and fighting, but you're learning and learning and learning, and you're taking in more and more and more. So as you start understanding, most paralegals go into cases, read cases, assist lawyers, and do the groundwork for the lawyer, and the lawyer comes back and does everything else. But I found myself doing the whole range by myself because for 30 years in prison, I was by myself doing paralegal. Wow. <clears throat> That's interesting. And I don't think that a lot of people realize that paralegal is the one who does all the grunt work. Like They do a lot of it. I work for an attorney who's, in my opinion, the best in the, I, Amy Belger, the best in the world. She, she fights like she's your parent. Really? Yeah, she won't give up, she'll keep it honest, she tells you what it is. Every step from beginning to end deals with honesty, being up front and giving you the best representation you can have. And I'm honored to work for her. Wow. That's, that's great, that's great. That's, there's a whole lot of us that really need it and definitely can't afford it. Correct. And that's probably and, you know, still sitting up And there. that's a key point. So, you know, for being in there 30 years, you know a lot of you you know a lot of guys in there right. and but we had a conversation with a guy who gonna see parole but he thinks he's ready for parole because he has the time in but he, he's not ready for parole and so she had to be brutally honest with him and said you're not ready and if you want to go to this parole boy you can go but you're going to get set back if you want to put in the work then you put in the work so he called me later and said what was that about I said, the problem with that is, is that she's the one in, we're fighting for your life. If you want to help us fight for your life, help us. If you don't want to help us fight for your life, then we'll get you another attorney who won't. He turned around and said, I'm going to do all the work. I said, okay, and we'll give us the ammunition to fight for your life, and that's what we'll do. And he's doing it, so. That's incredible. Yeah. And it's really noteworthy because a lot of times paralegals don't get the recognition for the hard work that they do. And I heard you say that you were helping other people, but you were not able to, it took you a long time before you got your case to the forefront. Correct. I had um, John and Linda Thompson, two extraordinary lawyers as well, won a lot of cases in Massachusetts. John, in fact, John, they called habeas king. So... I had them and they were fighting. They found issues that got me out on a habe and the SJC overturned it. It was so incredible the injustice that they had done that I got out in 2008. I was out for two years working. I came home one day, I was about to eat and watch a movie and there's a knock on the door. I opened the door and it's the US Marshals and they said the judge wants to see me. They brought me back. And I woke up next morning back in Walpole prison I said, what's going on? They said, well, the SJC just over sent to turn the case back on you. You're going back. I said, okay. So I had to start anew in 2008, which I stayed there another 12 years before another judge got it and read the whole case and seen everything on it. And he technically apologized to me and said, you should have been out years ago. But, you know, justice is hard to get, man. How do you apologize for 12 years if you've taken someone's life? I that, listen. <laughs> that part, 
Like, what is an apology? Like that part they they don't get. They don't get that. You know, in those twelve years, that was the most drastic twelve years of my life. Those twelve years, I lost my son. I lost my mother. I lost my grandfather. I lost my grandmother. I lost a lot in them twelve years. But mm. like they say, mm. that's your burden. That's your shoulder. You got to burden it on. So it was issues that I had to deal with. So I, you know, we have to apologize. And you know, James, forty-one years in jail, yeah. wrongfully convicted, and this is not uncommon. Um, and so I just feel like I need to apologize for the system. And at some point, maybe we'll have you come back on and talk about that and what that, because people don't, they think, far too many people think if you're in jail, you must be guilty. And so, and that's, uh, that's not the case. Not the case at all. Um, but back to your work as a paralegal, and that brought you to this case that you, um, this Mathis case. Can you... Uh, and that's a relatively new ruling. Can you share what that case is about? What it is, um, Sheldon Math Mathis case. Sheldon Mathis. Mathis. So what happens in this case? That's just a, a, an extension of a case that the United States Supreme Court came down with on the Miller versus Alabama. At that point, they basically, if you're going to have a society which, you know. <laughs> The yeah. United States is our, you know, if yes. you're going to have a society and most of it talks about rehabilitation, how can you say you're about rehabilitation as a society and you won't give the juveniles a chance? If you won't give the juveniles a chance if, at rehabilitation, then you're not about rehabilitation because those are the first ones that could be rehabilitated. They were kids when they committed their act. So Miller came down and they said establish an age group. Massachusetts said 17. Anybody that committed a crime as a juvenile in the age limit 17, that life without parole is unconstitutional because you can't be rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. So they started at 17. Okay. So every other kid, the 18, the 19, and the 20s were in there and older, like, what about us? So the debate came up in mm -hmm. Sheldon Roberts, Sheldon Mathis case, and that they raised the age limit to 20. Okay. And because they raised the age limit to 20, the law firm that I work at, we switched from criminal appeal aspects to parole aspects. So we got 25 of these Mathis kids and we're getting them ready to see parole board. We're setting them up, we're getting their files. I'm finding housing for them. We're gonna find jobs for them, okay. and we're gonna set them up to when they see parole, every requirement that this parole board wants or seeks, will get. Okay. Because we're trying to get them back out to society so they can rehabilitate themselves and become a productive member. Right. Our society, yes. And it's, it's interesting that um, they, would, they would stop at 17 and it took so long to go to 21 because we know the brain development, you know, people, are not, the brain is not even fully developed until your late 20s. Right. So even t to say 21 and under, it really should be further than that. It, it really should be a little older. It correct, but I, I believe, and from talking with people, lawyers and district attorneys and people in the criminal mm -hmm. justice system, is believed that you know if you just go to say, because they say in the frontal lobe aspect wasn't fully developed, so thereby their cognitive skills and all that. So right. when you're talking at that extent right there, you don't want to, and I, I, I believe this, you don't want to just go to 26. If you say, okay, they're saying the brain developed 26, we start right. off at 26, you're opening the floodgates. And I know, but what they're doing and we assume they're doing is taking little pieces at a time. Okay. You're edging up the ladder. So right now it was 17, they took from 17, okay, that went good. In Massachusetts, it fell under Diachinko, that mm -hmm. Diachinko versus Attorney General. Uh, so that fell to 17. Now you got Manish that's raising it to 20. Good. So that group right there is now on the wrong. And it's suspected that, you know, later on down the line, view how this goes, that they'll reach the age group. And perhaps they, sh and I am an advocate that they could, they should, because adverse childhood experiences, trauma that young people will experience, um, trauma that people experience as a child, impacts their, is another consideration. Correct. 
So we're not we're talking about brain development, and then we're talking talking about adverse childhood experiences and trauma. All of that impacts the young person's decision ability to make wise decisions. Good. So my I'm an advocate, as I'm sure you that we all all are to up that up some. They, you know? And I believe that they will. But what they're doing now is taking off little chunks of the time and trying to get to that age. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're dealing with it like that, that's the way I say it. I'm actually, I just finished, before I came here, I was doing an essay on juvenile justice in the frontal lobe, and I was dealing with the whole aspect surrounding it. So yeah. I, I truly agree that they will raise that. They, I, I truly think they will raise that age. Good. But I think they're just taking their time to get there because of the negative impact that started back in the early 1990s when they labeled these kids allegedly super predators. Exactly. So when they labeled them super predators, you know, just like any argument, you got proponents on both sides. You got the families, you got the lawyers, you got the advocate for juvenile saying, no, they should be out, this, that, and the other. But then you got the other families, the district attorneys and all them saying, no, they committed this crime, they should be in. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I believe the justices have to weigh which side it's gonna be on. But mm -hmm. brain evaluating evidence and all this other stuff and the fact that society is built on rehabilitation and if they're like the, the Supreme and Miller built off we they're saying these kids can be rehabilitated and if you truly believe in that as society you have to stop with them because if you saying that they can't then no one can it has to stop with the kids you know there's a there's a saying that you can judge you know, you judge the morality of a society based on how they treat their children, how they treat the young people. So it speaks directly to what you're saying. Um, and yeah, not realizing what that kid has been through before he committed the crime. If he did commit the crime, you see what I'm saying? His yeah. background, his yeah. family structure, yeah. you know, and it's not all on them. Correct. You know? And that's part of the essay that I was just writing on it because all of these kids, when I looked at their background, some of them started um, shooting and doing heroin when they were 12 and 13. Some started getting high, they were running with gangs, they were doing all this. But they, a lot of them were being used by older adults right. to commit crimes and, you know. Mules. Yeah, and you, you know, they're following the leader, as they say. Right. and they got lost in the mix and lost in society and now they're lost in prison. But while you're in there, if you do the right thing, get your focus back again, then society's willing to open the door for you again and give you another chance because it's built on rehabilitation. And a lot of these kids are worthy of just that. Absolutely. Like my co-defendant, Freddie Clay. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he was a juvenile. He had just turned 16 and they gave him natural life knowing that he was not the perpetrator right. of the crime at all, Correct. including myself. You know, we did, we, we've been in together, we, we know. Yeah. We, we went through the struggles up and down, you know what I mean? We went through the law books and when they slammed the door in our face, you know what I mean? Like when I overturned my case, they turned around and gave it back to me 10 months later. You know yeah. And flipped, convicted in 81, flipped it in 83, turned it over. SJC went back, went back down to lower court and hey, guilty again, same flavor, you know what I mean? But the impact is a lot more. See what people don't understand is when you really overturn your case, if you're in that position like you were and I were, mm -hmm. you get a feeling like you never had before. You wake up the next morning, though you're still in prison, mm -hmm. the air smells better, you can smell everything cooking. Hey man, you got a little jolt to you now, mm -hmm. all right, right, I'm on the other side, I'm working towards going home now. For them to come back and close that door on you, it necessarily put you in the closet where you're like, okay, where am I at now? You're lost back in the sauce again. So now you gotta get back to doing what you call a bid. Yeah. You have to get back in your old routine that's hard to get back into because you're traumatized. Right, it, yeah. But and even through all the traumatization, and we know that jails are inhumane beyond measure in all of the setbacks, it's amazing that you and many other men and women get out and you're passionate about helping other people. Can you speak to the work that you're doing with, um, that you've done with the young people? And where does that come from after you've 
dealing with so much injustice. Where does your heart to help others come from? Where, what is that about? Well, I believe that every human being in this world gives back in some way. If you help a lady get up on the bus, that's a good deed that's given back to me. Mm -hmm. If you can contribute to these inner city neighborhoods, to these kids, and try to get them on the right track, then you don't have to worry about it. If you got 100 kids that's running the street doing crime and doing this and that, if you can reach one of them, you might be mad, I couldn't reach another one, but reaching that one mm -hmm. may have been enough. So when you think about it that way, yeah, I worked at, I worked at Ronga and the me, I'm gonna be honest with you, it's the greatest organization ever. I mean, starting from Molly, to Joe, to Scott, going all the way down the line. They are about helping society and helping these kids. I feel good getting in my car every day and going to work. At because four o'clock in the morning. Correct, I didn't have to be there till 12 in the afternoon. We worked 12 to eight, but I would get there at four in the morning and work all the way to 12 to eight because you got 25 kids, you got to go out and see, make sure they're doing the right thing, go out with them, talk to them, befriend them, and get them, let them know that you're there for them. Mm -hmm. So when you're working them eight hours a day, it's hard to reach all of them. I like to, I don't like to see, I, they see them twice a week, that's great. Me personally, I wanted to know the kids, I want the kids to know me, so I got there at four in the morning. Wow. And that way, I could see my head twice a day if I wanted to. Think about how you got here. Odds are, you had a good start. Family, guidance, chances to fail, and overcome. Roca gives that kind of support to the highest risk young people. The 17 to 24 year olds in gangs or in jail who keep the police busy who need change, but aren't ready yet. Take Andre, he just got out of jail. A Roca youth worker, Eric, knocks on his door. At first, Andre is like, <laughs> yeah, right. But Roca's relentless. Eric never stops reaching out. Eventually, Andre begins to trust Eric and comes to Roca. He gets a job on our work crews, takes high school classes, and learns critical work and life skills. Then once again, Andre slips. He stops coming. He gets fired. He avoids Roca and gets in trouble. But Roca's ready. We know setbacks are part of the process. Eric stays on Andre and keeps bringing him back until Andre learns he can stumble, recover, and keep going. Eric works with Andre's probation officer and the police. Together, they support and push Andre, helping him move forward. After four years with Roca, Andre knows how to work. He has goals and the tools to make it. Working in the streets for three decades, Roca has helped thousands of young people change their lives. For them, we have to improve every day. So we track and analyze everything, every knock on a door, every class, every failure and accomplishment. Data keeps us accountable. Data proves Roca works. Take a look. Our continued success depends on you. Support Roca so we can help more young people prove that change is possible. It's about reaching the kids. These kids, man, they really don't have nothing in these neighborhoods. So they try to pray and pry all the people who may have something that they don't have. Mm -hmm. It ain't about that, man. My first thing when I work there is, okay, I got these kids. First thing, I'm going to get them a job because I want to teach them the, the essence of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because once you get that paycheck, okay, once you get two or three, you don't got to say nothing to the kid no more. You can back away because they're saying to themselves, well, I'm not quitting. I need this check every two weeks. This is good money I'm putting up. So they're not going to, that's the first thing. Keeps them out of the street for eight hours, four of part-time. All right? 
So when you find them a job, that's it right there. Then you got, you know, that's what I like about room. You can come to the Runka facilities, the gym, there's this, there's that. There's everything in there for these kids, Even man. Even the health clinic. Everything. They got everything up in there for these kids. And they try to control it within that whole building facility. If there's wow. a problem, they reach out, this, that, and other. And they're just they're a really great organization. Well, and... and I'm sorry. And they work with the parents also, don't they? They do. They work with the parents and help them too. Because they're struggling yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, because they're coming, in, they're coming back home and you know, go I mean, out it's in like the brand new almost. Go out in the community, you know? give out food, go in the community, take them out, drive you, do this and that. Great organization. Some of the good things in life. Good. Yeah. Then they deal about, real, they, they deal with these kids, right? And they try to get them on track. Right. And that's the best thing you can ask for. I had a kid that was in the gang and, you know, the gang sits there and they see me with them. They know I'm with Roka. They know what we're trying to do. So there was an issue when one of the kids wanted to get out the gang and Roka's not letting you out. No, we're not letting you. You're not getting this kid back in the gang. So I ended up talking to one of the leaders and I said, you seen me with him before. You seen when I went and got him. I said, you knew what I was about when I get there. You didn't think I can accomplish the job. That's why you didn't care. But now you see he wants to get out. There's a problem. So they end up letting him go. The kid was doing all right, working a job, going to school. I went to his graduation, everything. Wonderful. Great kid. I have to um, shout out to Molly. <laughs> I met Molly and I was at Walker when it was just a seed. It's incredible the work that's being done. And it's, the work is... Um, because of the work that you've done, you, Roka was recognized by the um, royal family. Can you talk to us about that well, experience? That's because of the work Roka as an all-around general organization has mm -hmm. done. Because it's spread out in Correct. many different they're, Yes, they got one, they got them in Lynn, they got Connecticut, they got Baltimore, Chelsea, mm -hmm. they got them in Boston. So they got rumors in the one in Chelsea, they're renovating right now, over nice. five million. They're renovating that whole building. Nice. But it's all for kids and helping them. Yeah, but the royal family and them coming, and I met Prince William, he is a great, great guy. You know, they were supposed to, he sat there and he dealt with the issues. His wife came with there and she attended. And when they were leaving, I sat there and was talking to him and I said, you got a lot of people downstairs waiting to see you. They were supposed to go out the side door. He was all like, oh yeah, I said, yeah, they're waiting to see you down there. So they turned around and him and hey, I don't know what they did. They said, we're going out the front. And the Secret Service switched everything around. Okay. And when they hit the hallway, you know, <laughs> a mom's a mom to me. And mm -hmm. she's a mom because as soon as she hit the hallway and she seen them young mom with kids, everything was dropped. Let me see it. <laughs> she grabbed this out of pet and they went to the next kid. William went down, they shake everybody's hand and they wow. went out the front, right? And they said they would come back and I nice. believe them. It is a great, great organization and I'm glad people see it that way. Yeah. Yes, we have some footage of that um, that we'll include in this. It was, yes. I'm sure that was a very nice honor for work that, for very legitimate, very legitimate work. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to um, help people sort of rethink the narrative that they have about young people. Mm -hmm. And you spoke to that to some extent. Um, what, what advice would you give to teach educators, parents, people who are working with young people to um, help um, kind of, what is it? Um, change that narrative that they might have a young, about young people because they see people in gangs, they think, oh, they like that thug life or they, that's where they want to be. Like what is, I think well, people just don't recognize that. They see them that way, but if you actually have a chance, you can take the most violent kid out there that's doing whatever he want to do, but if you take him out of that environment mm -hmm. and bring him to your environment, he meet people that's around you, this and that, and they're not in that environment. They don't walk with their pants down. They don't have their hats backwards. They don't do all this and do all that. They'll see that. Mm -hmm. They'll start conforming to that because they're no longer in that animalistic attitude. They're, they're adjusting to what's, what, what they're around. 
it, and we're talking black and white, Asian kids. We're, not, all, we're talking all races. No matter who you are, no matter who you are, these kids. Listen, man. Let's, you said it. The best thing you could say. First thing in the agenda is their kids. They're no different from your kids and anyone else's kids. They were just born in a or raised in a different environment, mm -hmm. and some of them are products of that environment that they don't have to be, but they don't know no better. So they need guidance, they need and, and who better to guide them than? either somebody that's been through it or someone that's know where it's gonna be. Right. You know, they don't wanna be, you don't wanna be in jail. What are you gonna get in jail? You're locked in your cell 24 hours a day. 23 hours a day, that's right. Do, and when these, when, you get, when these kids, you come in contact with these kids, uh, some of them just dropped out of school. So the education level is low. Correct, and that. So for them to have any type, to develop any kind of job experience, do you take them back into school yeah. and then they work? That's what I mean about, that's what I like about Roca, is that they got people there, got their own classroom and all that. So why the kids are working the job? They don't really quiet that much or something. In fact, Roca hires them mm -hmm. to cl clean up the community. Hmm. They hire them to clean up the community so they got a little income coming. And then part of you doing that community, afterward, you have to take classes. And one of them classes, if you don't got it, is a GED, a high set yeah. class. Yeah. So you're going to get your high set. Mm -hmm. And once you get the high set, then it, then the youth worker is going to look for a better job for you. So it's all, the whole wrong organization, and, and that's why I work that with kids, and it's, the better, it, it's about getting these kids back on course and giving them a jump start on showing them what life is supposed better, to be better, like as a productive citizen. Life. Correct. Cool. Good. I would imagine, and we don't have much time, but that there will be a number of young people returning yes, from right. with this Mathis case. Over and so, um, and I would imagine that they will need a lot of support. And I'm wondering um, what just a larger society can do to support these people, these young people coming out. What are your thoughts about that? Um, That's something that. Especially in light of post-incarceration syndrome. We know spending so much time in jail, especially when they're young. Yeah. Like, what are, what are they going to need? What can we as a society do or people who want to do something individually? Oh, so my, as a society, I, I, I'm saying give them a chance. The first thing they're going to be looking for, because we're going to find them housed and they probably have to do a step down, which will require a sober house or whatever. So that pot's going to be situated for a year. Mm -hmm. All right. So when they reach out or I'm out looking, if society, if you really want to help this, uh, turn them around, help, help us get him a job. Help him, you know, help him get that groundwork that he needs from financially being dependent on his own work. Meaning Kid I get or her. It, correct, or her, yeah, <laughs> okay. to, to, do their, to do their groundwork. You know what I mean? Once they get that, once they get a job, and they got a place there, and they're used to getting up, going to work, coming home, doing this and doing that. They have a then sense they understand. Of... Yeah, correct. And it, and I, and I tell people every day that if you was in prison, you work six to eight hours a day for a mm -hmm. dollar or two a day. That's all you make, a dollar or two. If you can work in a prison but won't come out here and work, then it's uh, then it's up to me to evaluate whether you even belong out here. Okay. Okay. Listen, um, I appreciate you coming and sharing. Um, we'd like to thank you yes. very much. I and thank you all too. Thank you for watching. Yes. And we look forward to um, our upcoming shows. And we and wish you the segment. best of luck with the work that you're doing. A whole lot more. All right, so if you have another seven, maybe next time I'll bring the next, the first Mattis client. Oh, that would be nice. Yes. We got him out. First Thanks. client up is out. Really? Yeah, so we'd next, love to have, I think a face with a name and a story speaks volumes. Next time he'll be here. If oh, wonderful. I, I have to find out when he, you no, know, he's in a um, step down now, so I could probably okay. see when I could get him out there to do it all. What, something that like would that. be next wonderful. Time. All right. That would be wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Big Guys. And thank you for watching Confronting Injustice.